All right, so let's go through this fire announcement thing real quick. Um, so please note the locations of surrounding emergency exits uh, and located nearest lit exit signs. Uh, in the event of a fire alarm or other emergency, please calmly exit to the public concourse area. Exit, uh, emergency exit stairwells leading to the outside of this facility are located along the public concourse. For your safety and emergency, please follow the directions of public safety. Um, all right, now that that's done. Uh, my name is Mike Rhodes. I am a architect in Dell EMC's data protection division, specializing in cloud native uh, technologies. And um, I'm here to talk about uh, Kubernetes and uh, everything involved in protecting Kubernetes, running stateful workloads in Kubernetes, um, disaster recovery, all those type of things. Uh, so when we first started looking at this, the first thing we asked ourselves is, uh, where is the data, right? So I think uh, the best way to look at it is from the classic Cloud Foundry, Pivotal Application Sense, we took a look and said, OK, well, in the Pivotal Application Service, you're usually running 12-factor apps. You're using a service broker to attach to external services. And those services sit somewhere else, right? They're outside of the container runtime, uh, outside of Diego. They're, they're somewhere else, typically on uh, one or more virtual machine. Maybe they're in the cloud somewhere. Um, and they likely are run by somebody else, right? The app team writes the code. Uh, the service team, the database team, the infrastructure team might run the database, control the database, et cetera. Um, and this you know, is good. Right? So they have SLAs, they offer you protection. Uh, but this could also uh, be a little bit scary, right? Because you don't own that uh, infrastructure. So your data is somewhere where you're not 100% in control of it, right? So you really, really have to trust those SLAs. Um, but now, Kubernetes uh, and you know, specifically PKS is becoming a thing that we could utilize, right? Not every database has to run on a VM anymore. Not any, every database has to you know, uh, be set up in the, the, the uh, let's say, the older sense as, as opposed to these modern technologies that we have. So maybe this is something that we could just play around with and uh, see if there's anything else there, right? So perhaps we could apply PKS to running a database, right? Um, and then the next question is why? So why would you run a database or any stateful workload on Kubernetes? Uh, this is a question that we talk about a lot. Uh, number one is containerized efficiencies. Maybe that service, right? Uh, actually, Cloud Native is all about running things more efficiently. Uh, maybe that database, that traditional database you have, like MySQL, uh, will run just a little bit faster, maybe a little bit more efficient, use less resources. Uh, maybe it will run really, really good, and you could have more instances uh, across your infrastructure. Quicker provisioning, uh, containers load up faster typically than, than VMs. Uh, that's always a good thing. Deployment consistency, so we hear from a number of operators that like uh, running the same platform, right? So deploying all to the same thing all the time, your apps, data services, all to one plane is nice to work with. It works everywhere, right? Kubernetes runs everywhere. Any public cloud works on-prem because is you know, just came out, but it, it works on a number of different clouds. Uh, and most importantly, in my mind, is you get to take advantage of the Kubernetes ecosystem. So inside Kubernetes itself, you could plug your application and your data services into it and take advantage of that, which we're going to see today um, in my next couple of slides. But also all of these, you know, booming ecosystem uh, applications that are out there that attach onto Kubernetes, logging, monitoring, all these things, they're just like one download and one deploy away from, and, and, and that's a, there's a, a really cool use case that you could do for uh, on top of these data services you're running. And I, I guess also importantly, it, Kubernetes is all the rage, right? All the cool kids are doing it nowadays, so why don't we take a look and see if, uh, if there's something there. Um, typically, if you're new to Kubernetes, um, the way you would run a stateful a workload, or let's say a database, in this example, MySQL, is you take ad advantage of uh, a first-class resource called a stateful set. Uh, a stateful set will control one or more uh, pods. Uh, each pod is one or more container. 
and you run your stateless workload in there, like a MySQL server, and then uh, the stateful set attaches that to a persistent volume. So whatever uh, storage under the covers you're using, maybe you're on AWS and you want to provision an EBS volume, uh, the Kubernetes will do that for you via persistent volume claims. And this will all lead up to a service. Service is like, sort of like your load balancer, and it will, it'll uh, push traffic to a container or uh, you know, dependent on demand. So should we run databases? Now you know why, should we? If you look at it historically, uh, back a couple years ago, Kubernetes released in uh, June of 2014. And between, now, uh, between then and around two, the end of 2016, uh, even thinking about running a database in Kubernetes was going to get you fired, right? It's just not, it wasn't originally built for that. It was built for stateless workloads, very similar to Cloud Foundry. Uh, but then at the end of 2016, uh, there was a beta feature introduced uh, called PetSets. And that's when we started to see people you know, pop up MySQL databases in test and dev. Uh, you might see a risky person every once in a while around something in, in production, but pet sets were very new. Um, and uh, during this time, the ecosystem for Kubernetes kind of just went you know, insane. And we started to see more and more projects uh, pop up on top of Kubernetes, uh, plug into Kubernetes from the bottom, and more just in general workloads being run in production. Um, so this past December, stateful sets, uh, pet sets was renamed sta stateful sets, um, and it became GA. So it's, it's production quality, uh, so to speak. And now we start to see people talking about, OK, well, maybe I should take my classic, let's say MySQL database running on VMs, hard to provision. Um, maybe I should move that into Kubernetes and take advantage of its orchestration and all its uh, uh, ideal first-class uh, citizen resources. And as the future, uh, as the future moves on, uh, as Kubernetes starts to get more and more adoption, which obviously it is, um, we'll start to see the storage integration. You know, right now there's 60 to 100 different storage integrations into Kubernetes. We'll start to see that level out, and we'll start to see a lot more uh, DevOps tools. Right? So once you get, the, once you get your database running, then it's all about protecting it, monitoring it, et cetera, et cetera. And we're, we're going to see a ton more databases and other stateful workloads in production on top of Kubernetes. So like I said, if you choose to run your stateful workload on, on, on PKS or Kubernetes, um, get in a running stateful set. The next thing after that is, uh, in our opinion, in my opinion, is how do I protect it? Make sure that that data never goes away, right? Uh, one of the things we have here uh, at, at Dell EMC is a product called Data Domain. So Data Domain um, is one of our most important products. It, 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 it's all about backup management and protection storage. So uh, not necessarily how you take the backup, but what you do with the backup after you've taken it, right? So um, you have a lot of efficiencies. You have storage efficiencies, network efficiencies. Uh, data domain's uh, probably biggest feature is deduplication. So if you think about taking 1,000 snapshots a day, uh, and they're, they're all one or more gigabyte, uh, data domain helps you cut that by 70% on the storage end. Uh, it helps with network efficiency in that when you take a snapshot, it won't even send bits that it already has back on the da on data domain. So if you think about taking a, a uh, a backup of MySQL database every, let's say, 10 minutes, 99% of that data is going to be the same every backup you take, right? So why do we send that across the network? Why do we store that on, on our servers on the, on the, uh, the back end? Uh, also protection, right? So it's, it's highly encrypted. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but a, a lot of the hacking that will go on in uh, in in the world isn't going after production workloads. They're going after your backups, right? So they'll steal a, a copy of something that you had from a month ago and, and get critical information. Data domain helps with that. Um, other cool feature of data domain, if you have multiple of them in different sites, in different clouds, it, it quickly and easily uh, moves backups and workloads over to other data domains. So let's say you wanted to do uh, some uh, disaster recovery from on-premises to AWS. Your backups are already there, and you could get them up and running in AWS very easily. 
Data domain can be deployed as an appliance uh, on premises or as a, as a virtual instance in a public cloud. We support all the public clouds. And um, it plugs into Kubernetes as a persistent volume. So this would be a secondary storage use case inside of, inside of Kubernetes. You do your primary storage, let's say, on an EBS volume if you're running AWS. And you'll do your secondary storage, your backup storage uh, on top of data domain. So switching it up a little bit, um, so we, we have this data domain product, and it plugs into Kubernetes. Um, well, we said, well, how is the user going to invoke it, right? Um, and that's where the Open Service Broker API comes in. So we've been working with the Open Server, uh, Service Broker API group uh, on the specification for, for a while. And um, we are in the process, uh, almost done with, adding a feature called extensions, uh, formerly known as actions. It could be actions again. Uh, an example of an action would be backup and restore, right? There's day two operations. Uh, there could be other things like ping and start, stop, pause a, uh, a service. But obviously, <laughs> backup and restore are the ones that we are uh, most uh, uh, interested in. Uh, and the goal is to enable new endpoints to the API in a generic way. And this allows current things out there to be reused, right? So Azure's MySQL database API has a backup and restore option. We, don't want to, we didn't want to tell them you have to switch to this backup and restore API to be able to integrate with, with uh, the Open Service Broker API. So that, that was a big feature in this. Um, and it removes this sort of burden of managing API definitions, especially backup and restore, which can be very complicated, um, from the OSB API specification. So the way this works at an extremely high level is that the service broker, when you get a list of the actions, returns an open API document. Open API uh, 3.0. Uh, before 3.0, it was called Swagger, if you're familiar with Swagger. And platforms or users, whoever is using the service broker, uh, can uh, take a look at the open API document and understand which are the new endpoints that they can run, and what are the payloads that are needed to run them. So this is currently in the validating stage. Uh, we do have a PR here, uh, and we're looking for collaborators. This is very close to going into the specification, which means this will be you know, uh, there to take advantage of for all service providers. And just at a very quick uh, lower level, uh, the way it works is when you provision a service instance, so you do a put on service instances, um, you get a, a result back. Originally, you would only get a dashboard URL, which is sort of your management UI, and the last operation. Uh, now, in blue, what you get back is an extensions API, and this tells you what those new actions are that you want to run, any credentials you need to, to, to run them. And this returns this Swagger doc, and it just explains new endpoints, right? So in, in this example, um, on the same service broker, you could run a backup and restore and all those type of things. So what does that look like when we put all these things together? A database running in, in, on Kubernetes, uh, OSB API, and data domain. Well, what we decided to do was we took the Pivotal application service, so classic Cloud Foundry. Um, we set up a PKS next to it. We put our own custom open service broker API running inside of Kubernetes. This one is, has a focus on uh, MySQL databases. And then down at the bottom, we have our data domain uh, appliance. This one's running in AWS. This, actually, all of this is. And on that is a DDBoost volume. So this is a volume you provision. This is your secondary volume store, right? So all of your backups are going to go to this particular uh, volume. And then we have our user. We have me sitting over there on the left. And he would do his typical things uh, that he would do with with CF, right? So we would do a CF marketplace, a CF create service, um, and this would all go back through the cloud controller, through the open service broker API, and spin up my stateful set for MySQL very quickly. Just pushes out a new container image, sets up a service, sets up the stateful set, attaches my EBS volumes in this case, and I have a MySQL service ready to go, right? And you know that's great. I now have a really fast on-demand MySQL service running. Um, but what about backup and restore? So we created uh, a CF plugin, uh, a number of CF plugins um, to do just that. So uh, in orange now, because it's new, 
uh, I could take a, a CF backup, pass in my service instance name, name it something, and through obviously the same path, uh, it's gonna go into Kubernetes and in this case run a job. So a job in Kubernetes is also a first class citizen. It's just a task that runs to completion. It runs, it does something, and then it stops. In our case, this job mounts our ddboost volume for backup storage, goes into the MySQL uh, service instance of your choice, and pushes uh, a MySQL dump to your backup storage. Uh, after that, you could go in and do a CF list backups of your particular uh, service instance and get a whole list of all the different backups you've taken in the past. You could do a CF restore, which just does the inverse, a different job, pulls from this ddboost volume and data domain and restores your, your service instance. And then from there, we thought about a whole other, you know, tons, tons and tons of use cases that we could do from this open service broker API. You could migrate uh, services, uh, you could clone services at, you know, the touch of a button, all those type of things. Um, so I do have a quick demo that I'd like to see if it's working uh, that I could show you. Let's see here. Let me come out of come out of this. Where are we at? Okay. How's the how's the text, Louie? Oh, it's still light. Horribly light. Faint. All right. Let's see if we could we could beef it up real quick. And if we run out of time, we'll have to, we'll have to skip it. No, it's, it's not working for me. All right, is it, if I increase it, does that help? A little better? Okay, we'll go with it. So at the t on the top, I have my CF command line, the usual stuff. Um, so, so I'm gonna check the marketplace. In my marketplace, this is my uh, service, my, my SQL running on Kubernetes. I'm just gonna quickly go and uh, create one. Protected is the plan, and I'm gonna do CF sum two. So on the bottom left here, I'll increase this as well. So I'm gonna do a kube control, and I'm gonna do a get pod, and I'm gonna watch the pods. So right now, the pods I have running here, um, my OSB server, and I have a baked MySQL up already, so I don't have to copy data into it and, and waste your precious time. So if we watch this, we hit uh, this provision command, um, and there we go. See, we're starting to watch this, this pod pop up, right? It's running, it's pending, it's working eventually. So I'm gonna X out of this. And we clear. So if we take a look at services, we'll see we have a new load balancer, MySQL. And this is using the Elastic Load Balancer in AWS. Um, this is the access point, remember, into my service. And we'll, do a, we'll take a quick look at the stateful set. And so I have two MySQL stateful sets running, one from 23 hours ago and one from 12 seconds ago. So now I could fully access this MySQL service, it's there, it's good to go. Um, so if we take a look again, so now I have two services running in my environment. Um, so now I'm just gonna quickly show you that one of these databases. Show databases. So uh, let's use world. And I think I have, uh, a table called city with like 5,000 rows, right? Uh, 4,000 4, rows. So here's my, here's my database. Uh, I'm gonna quit this guy. Exit, clear, and then clear this guy. So now I'm gonna, on kube control, I'm gonna do uh, a get for jobs. So there should be, oh, and I'm gonna watch this. So there's no jobs found. But if we keep watching, I'm gonna do a CFS, so I don't remember, so I don't forget the name of my services. I'm gonna do a CF backup, CF sum one, 
uh, and I'm going to name it backup one. So what we should see is under the jobs, new container pops up. The age for whatever reason is invalid, so that's just a demo flaw. <laughs> and I'm going to go take a few more. So backup two, you see a new pod pop up. This is doing that, these tasks, four, and then number five. And then the last thing in the bottom right corner, if this didn't time out, I'm going to, let's see, re-log into my kube node. Um, and I'm just going to quickly show you. Again, i got to zoom in a little bit. Uh, LS, uh, I'm going to show you this mount. So here, this is my ddboost mount going back to data domain. So if you see here, uh, the name of the pod, the name of the service, uh, comes up in a new folder on my dd mount. And if I just take a look at that, I see my five backups there. And the important thing to note, um, whatever size these are, I could probably do it in human readable, but um, this says, you know, whatever it is, 30,000 bytes, or uh, it's only one of those that are actually being stored. So the deduplication is happening right here. Um, maybe, maybe one of those plus a little bit more of metadata, right? These are all stubs pointing back. We, we're not wasting this much that, uh, uh, in, in storage space. Uh, also, you could turn on encryption and all these things that, that, that make it much more secure. So I have my backups. I'm just going to go back in to my database again. Uh, let's see, show databases, because I keep forgetting. And I'm going to drop database world. OK, show again. World is gone. And then I'm going to do a CF restore, actually, a CF list backups on CF sum one, I think it was called. So there's my five backups. There's the date when they were taking. There's the size. OK, so 3.6 megs. Only one of those 3.6 megs is being stored on the, on the on data domain. Um, and then I'll just do a CF restore. CF restore, uh, CF sum one, backup, I don't know, four. Let's pick that one. So if you see bottom left-hand corner, here's another job running, another container popping up. It runs to completion, and then it's done. So the last little bit of this demo, we'll go back to my, my SQL server. We'll take a look at the databases. And then, obviously, world is back here. And we'll just double check, like star from city. And then those are my you know, 4,000 or so uh, rows. Um, like I said, other CF plugins we have, clone. If you have an active service instance, you could just clone it on this punch, punch a button. All of this stu uh, stuff possible via the Open Service Broker API. Um, so let's see how we're doing on time. I think we have six minutes. So that's one way to do things, right? That's one of our products. And I want to show you really, really, really quickly uh, two other ones on, on two separate slides. So data domain is one product. Another product we have uh, is one product and one pattern. So that's like a, a storage drive for your Kubernetes cluster. Another pattern we have is, is to use Avamar. So Avamar is another one of our classic on-premises solution. Um, it runs specific agents, and it can do the backups for you. It does uh, consistent state backups for your databases and, and other workloads. We uh, can uh, integrate Avamar clients inside of Kubernetes as a sidecar. So instead of having this one drive and a job that you mount, and it runs a particular workload, um, Avamar client will attach to your running application and keep it uh, you know, uh, in a backup state. So whatever that backup state may be, a full backup, uh, a logical, physical, incremental, Avamar sort of will take care of that for you. Uh, it offers you a web-based file level restore, so you don't have to restore from a command line or uh, from inside of like, Kubernetes itself. You do it from a centralized UI. You can also set policies and schedules from that same UI. Um, and it manages workloads across all clusters. So um, you know, if you have 50 Kubernetes clusters deployed, you could have Avamar running centrally, push out clients inside of your Kubernetes clusters to your MySQL servers, to whatever else you're running. 
and uh, manage uh, data production from a centralized point. And very simply, it just runs inside of that, inside of that stateful set. So we, we push the client in there, um, and it's running all the time. And then lastly, another product, this is an open source product of ours called Ocopy, pronounced Ocopy, regardless of how you see the spelling. Um, so this is an open source product. Uh, it's, it's, it focuses on test dev uh, for both PCF and Kubernetes. And it gives you a UI, a CLI, and an API-driven way to take what we refer to as cloud-native application copies. And that's sort of everything, right? So we're used to traditionally taking a copy of uh, the database, and you say, oh, the container and the, the container image. I'm backing that up separately. Um, Ocopy tries to merge all these things together. So the container code, whether it exists in Artifactory or some container uh, 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 registry, um, the container meta metadata, so all the environment variables and bindings, any attached storage, and then any data stores. It kind of clumps all these things together and takes a snapshot of it. And uh, this is important in a lot of ways. You could, you could think of some production use cases, um, but one of the ones that we were focused on is if you want to take a snapshot of something in production, let's say you have an app running in production, it's attached to a MySQL database, um, you have some bug on it. Well, why not take a, you know, when you fix that bug, why not take a snapshot from production and test that out in, in test or, or dev or, or staging before you push the change uh, to production? That's one of the main use cases for it. Um, but there are a, a bunch of other use cases that you, you could do. Again, third pattern that we have for integration in Kubernetes. And um, this is on GitHub, so feel free to uh, take a look and contribute and op open PRs, open issues, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to leave this shout out uh, uh, slide up and ask for questions. I know I spoke a ton, so any questions? Let's see if this guy works. Yeah. Louis? I don't know how to work it, so you got to figure that out. <laughs> this one. <laughs> I have a very similar. In the foreseeable future. Mine is. So with the data domain. Yes. It fell. So you have a bunch of different, different options. So in, in, in the data protection uh, division, we have a ton of products, and they all integrate with each other. So in data domain, they, there is a data domain centralized UI that you could use, and, and exactly what you said. You know, I think the gentleman that was speaking before me was talking about they have seven-year uh, uh, retention policies. They have to keep the data for long. There's cases like that you would handle inside of the data domain UI, and like pushing copies back and forth between sites and clouds, that would all be done there. Yep, you could do it. You could do it. Either, whatever you want. Yep. Any other questions? We got two. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining.